that if someone was born at the Tea Party or evangelical. There are 47% that are not evangelical. Right? 47% that are not. So, and when we look at the you know, more complicated stats, you know, being an evangelical only increases support for the Tea Party by 3%. Right? It's not huge. Right? And so, I, I put my money on our data any day before we start talking about, you know, I mean, because like I said, these funders, you know, they, they're more of conjecture than hardcore data, right? And then here's another uh, kind of uh, misnomer about support for the Tea Party. A lot of people think it's really about economic hardship, right? No, it's not. Support for the Tea Party is really not about that. In fact, economic anxiety is nowhere to be found statistically in our model. It completely goes away, right? Because it's not, it's really not about economic anxiety. That's what they want to say it's about, but it's not. And our data is backed up by some of the research that my buddy Devin Burkhardt done. It's just not, economic anxiety has nothing to do with support for the Tea Party. But let me, let me tell you another reason why I say that. Another reason why I say that is because I want to try to pull that apart and try to get to understand it. So if you look at folks who support the Tea Party, uh, if you just, okay, there are about 6% of the Tea Party or Tea Party supporters that are black, right? If you guys want to ask me why I think that is the case during the Q&A, I am happy to add my answers, right? Um, but it only really works for black folks. So the more wealth you have, or the, the more wealth you have, the more, excuse me, the more economically anxious you are, if you're black, the more you're going to support the Tea Party. But when, if you're white, it has nothing to do, the two are not even related, which suggests that support for the Tea Party is really more about the preservation of their way of life than the sort of material status and material anxiety, right? It has nothing to do with economic anxiety for white folks to support the Tea Party. Zero. That's good stuff. Um, okay, maybe two or three questions on different things in the title, and then we'll turn to whatever questions everybody has. Um, on this book, uh, nice book jacket, when I flip to the back of the book jacket, there's two authors in this book, and there's one picture. <laughs> okay. uh, and I've written a co-authored book with a colleague, and we don't have either of our pictures on our book, on our book but if we had it, it would have been both of ours. Right? So there's one picture on this book. Um, I would just like to ask you to talk a little bit about the personal journey of writing this book and, and that one picture and all of the, the dynamics that go into being an African American writing about the Tea Party and all the data that's speaking to Tea Party being hostile to minorities. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, the whole picture thing is, uh, thank you for asking that question. So, bottom line is, Matt didn't get the picture in time. <laughs> Right, that wasn't gonna happen. So it's like, no, I see all these other folks with their pictures in their books. I'm like, this might be my last book. I don't know, right? I want to have at least one book with my picture on the inside. Wow. So that's the story behind that. Um, but as far as being uh, uh, an African American, or an African, I prefer black, um, it's really difficult writing on something like this because people think, you know, that when it comes to this, you know, with a lot of biases, right? And, I'm, and I mentioned that earlier. I have my pride and my biases, right? But first and foremost, I'm a social scientist, and you'd be surprised, or maybe not surprised, you know, how many times on radio shows, talk shows, and stuff, and I get some caller will call in and ask me, did I really find what I found? And ask me, are you sure you can be objective? And it's like, yeah, I can be objective. I'm a social scientist. That's what we do. Um, but it's, the way that I approach this book, at least from my perspective, I can't speak from that, um, but from my perspective, you know, when I saw the Tea Party, after I looked at all the data, after I examined all the data, it just reminded me of all, you know, because, you know, my grandparents on both sides of the South, right? And just this sort of racial hostility, you know, that, I mean, they experienced overt racial hostility, right? I never really felt that, um, but they did. So when I think about their struggle, and my great grandparents struck, right? And not only that, but for my friends who are, you know, Latino or Asian American, I have a couple of relatives um, uh, who are homosexual, right? I see the hostility that they face, and I have this data right here, and it spoke to me. And I, I had to do what I could in enough time, in a timely enough fashion, before I could shape this into a social scientific argument, which we did, 
right? And we, this, these are, this is, as David said, this is a statistical four to four. You guys told me about my theory, but it's a statistical four to four. And we wanted to make this as rigorous as possible because we knew we were going to get people coming at us from all kinds of different angles, right? And not least of which was because of how we look. I'm obviously black. Matt is Latino, right? In the Wall Street Journal, James Taranto, you got to, you got to look this up. He suggests that we can't, we can't possibly be objective. James Taranto, I'll never forget that. If I see that guy this day, I got something for him, right? <laughs> or incompetent. In the New York Times, Charles Blow cited the day of, I can still remember the day, May 9th, 2010. It's not every day at the work period in the New York Times. So I remember that. And I remember some people in the comment section, you know, where people get a whole lot of courage because they don't have to identify who they are. They questioned my credentials on 538.com before it went to the New York Times. They questioned my credentials. That's fucking bullshit, you guys. Seriously, it's like, wait a second. I grew up in the hood, left the hood, went to the military, left the military, graduated from law at UCLA, left UCLA, went to the University of Chicago, award winning book, one of the most prestigious postdocs there is, and I'm still fucking not good enough? No. I can't, excuse me, I get really worked up when I think about this, right? Because we get tired of doing everything that's prescribed that we do, and we're still not good enough. That really gets tiring after a while, you guys. And so it, I, I take it as a personal front and insult when people question my credentials. And as President Obama said a little while ago, after the Trayvon Martin thing, oh, well, let's not get started on that, right? <laughs> but as he said, in the aftermath of that, the jury verdict, and he said he's experienced doors being locked across the street. He's experienced women clutching their purses as he enters an elevator, right? I've experienced that too, right? If you were an educated, if you were any black man, get by educated, that, that's bad, right? Because it's prejudice, right? But if you're an educated black man, and you still are confronted with that, you say, what do I have to do? And at a certain point, you can say, you know what? There's nothing I can do. Ignorance is rampant. There's nothing I can do about that but control the way our reaction, right? And that's all we can really do. We can't prove anything. What's left to prove? What is left to prove? So, so, it, so being a, uh, an African-American scholar writing about something like this, see, it's okay if I can find my work to race, right? My first book won a big award. Nobody care about that. But, oh, let me start write, writing about white attitudes? Oh, now I got a problem. <laughs> now I got a big problem. But you know what? I was well trained. I know what I'm talking about. Nobody's going to drop on me because I know I have to work twice as hard to get half as far. I know this already. I know the game. I've been playing it my whole life. Right? Nobody's ever going to drop on me when it comes to data or the empirical analysis because I know I'm going to be scrutinized at a much higher level than my colleagues. Right? That's it. So, you know what? If you're going to play the game, Stay at home. I'm coming out. I ain't staying at home anymore. I think it's a good time for us to take up some questions. <laughs> so the request is that you would speak to the microphone. Oh, okay. should I? What's that? Not you. Okay. Uh, and and to to make a question. You're, we'll give you a, a quick second to make a comment, if you have a comment to make, but certainly have questions to be, to be asked. So we'll start over here, and then we'll just all do it. I don't know if that's picking that up. Yes, this is a, a personal question directed at something you said. Why do you prefer being called black than African-American? Because black connotes the struggle of, it, it connects people like me to the struggle, you know, coming from slavery, uh, and the post-Bell period. If you're someone who, who immigrated from, you know, from, from Ghana or any other country in Africa, you move, you're an African American, right? Let me just be real. I'm not connected to them. I'm not, right? I'm not. I've been African one time. Northern Africa, right? I've never been to Africa. As my, one of my cousins would say, I ain't no African American. I ain't never stepped foot on that continent. Well, 
that's a very good question. Um, so are we talking about uh, the deployment of him as a Muslim, um, as not a real American, not born here? Yeah, those are those are dog whistle words, right? Um, where the plan, even in the 1920s, you know, they weren't shy about who said that, right? I mean, those are different times. Um, racism, overt racism, overt racism, right? It's really frowned upon these days. So, I mean, it's really, so the Tea Party is like the plan in the sense that, that, you know, there's massive amounts of outward activity, right? And once again, I want to stress that it's really not necessarily confined to racial outward activity. Right? It's about anybody that's an other. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you can say, I mean, you saw President Obama's face on a food stamp. There are so many images, not necessarily, not just words, but images, right? You know, showing the White House as, you know, uh, watermelon patch in front of it instead of grass, right? Showing him in various guises as a pen, as someone in Jake. As I mean, all these things, yeah, these are, they're not calling him the N word. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it suggests as much. So in that sense, they have planned or are like what they're different in that the Tea Party cannot afford to use some sort of evidence straight out the way that they do. Oh, yes, they have compared him, show him and Michelle as primates, right? As monkeys, as shit, right? Um, and this is something, this imagery goes back at least to the early 20th century, right? Probably goes back, probably goes back even further than that, but it's been documented all the way back to the early 20th century. So it's not just words, sir. It, there are images as well that are associated with, you know, sort of degradation of the president or the Congress.
right? We don't hear that much from them now because they're at the state and local level now. So they're not getting as much press coverage right now. So as far as the advice to uh, my city colleague, uh, Professor Donkey, I would say get your people out at the grassroots level <laughs> or at the local and state level, right? That's where all the action is. Would you have our students asking questions about their attitudes? Or do you think that those are questions that either can be deflected or are really the people just aren't in touch with their selves to be able to answer? Um, I think that asking attitudes of questions, depends on what kind of attitude we're talking about. We're talking about preferences for small government, those are set. If you start asking questions about, you know, uh, whether or not they, you know, support same-sex marriage, whether or not they support, um, you know, more money going to people of color, more uh, money going towards, well, public education would be a, a really good one. Immigration. Right? But yeah, immigration, anything that sort of touches on um, our group antipathy face-to-face is really going to be hard for them, for most people, to admit it because of this, what's called social desirability bias, right? One never wants to seem racist. Right, or homophobic or xenophobic in the presence of another person, unless they're a really close friend or a relative, and they're just kind of like they're used. Otherwise, they're really not going to, they're going to be loath to admit it. On the telephone, however, um, or the internet, they're more likely to admit these, these socially undesirable attitudes, right? So I would say probably not a good skill of interview. But just to, just to nail this down, in, to get your viewpoint nailed down here. Is it that the Tea Party is hiding this versus that the Tea Party is not aware? Um, so if you were to take your average, you know, like really uh, true believer, um, they are, I'm just going to, the data there is not the question. They're aware of it, they're cognizant of it, right? But they just don't want to admit it in the context of a face to face interview. They will feel more likely to do so on the phone. It's people that are offensive, right? People who are moderate supporters of the Tea Party who probably aren't aware of it, aware of their biases, if their biases slant the direction of intolerance, right? So people who strongly support the Tea Party, they're cognizant of their biases, right? And one of the things that we do in survey research, as you well know, we'll ask a series of questions that tap into the same thing. So we'll sort of tap dance around the same concept. Right? But we want to make sure we are measuring what we claim to measure. So we'll ask them four or five or six questions that basically capture the same concept. Right? And so what happens is if they answer one question one way and they answer another question another way, and, and more, if they really feel that, even if they feel it deep down inside, they're going to be more likely to answer, like if we ask them five questions on that, they'll be more likely to answer three or four of them in a really uh, honest way. Right? So we ask them a single question about racism, and we can't rely on that, because it's only one question, and that was easy just to sort of fend off. That's one of the great strengths of this book is all the data that you have in there, but it's all kind of compartmentalized. People can look at it or not if they want to engage with it, but it's all here. That's a true social scientist approach. I'm transparent about the data. Thank you. Yeah, right there. Question about that. I don't want government intruding on my life. 
Some of it is about that, and you do have a number of them for whom that is really their motivation, right? But more people, far more people, or far more probabilistically more people, were more likely to use that as a facade, right? To say that we don't like big government, right? So therefore, we don't like the president, we don't like the power, right? Well, the data clearly shows that it's not just about that. Because if, it, because if it were just about limited government, then what would happen is the relationship between the way that they feel empirically about Obama and social dominance, it would have no impact on the propensity for people to support the Tea Party. At all, it would have zero impact. But it still has a really strong, statistically significant connection to it, right? So it suggests that these people are really only saying, a lot of them are really only using the sort of libertarian line, the small government line, as a, as a facade. Their they would totally reject what you said, though. No, they would, of course they would reject, right? Of course they would reject, right? But as a matter of fact, though, there, in every chapter, we compare Tea Party conservatives and non Tea Party conservatives, right? And there are wide gaps on everything from how they feel about Obama to how they feel about same sex rights to how they feel about immigrant rights to how they feel about um, patriotism to how they feel about. Civil liberties, right? So to the extent that conservatism captures, self-identified conservatism captures this limited government perspective, yeah, that's part of it, but it's far from the whole story. Did you, did you find out in your research whether or not they were refusing to pay taxes? They were refusing to pay what? Refusing, resisting taxes. Oh, no, 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 we didn't, no, we didn't ask that question right now. So, yeah. Oh, over here. Uh, you know, your point about I'm not a member of the Tea Party, and I can tell you I'm conservative. You know, I'm a conservative, conserve jobs, I'm a conservative done for the great majority of people. Now, isn't the Tea Party just a logical follow-on of the Powell memo? Of the Powell, Powell, Lewis Powell memo of the early 70s? And then you know, all of those conservative, we've got to just call them conservative, but think tanks, well-funded, long duration, uh, focus, and then the media consolidation that followed. Uh, if you go around and listen to talk radio and go over to Eastern Washington, all you're going to hear is Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity. You go to the next town and then you pick up the same station again and the same, you know, it just gets repeated. So if you listen to enough of this stuff and you have certain hot button issues uh, that money has been focused on through focus groups, and, and this is, a lot of people are paid a lot of money to find these hot button issues. And then you got the media out there. And remember, they took away 1090 here in Seattle. That was a, kind of an alternative radio. So to answer your question, how do we know what we know? It's because, you know, there's a lot of money and a lot of psychology, and they've got the media. And, you know, you pump enough of that stuff in, and now you have young people without experience that don't know, you know, where the, how it all is started, that's all they know. So the question is, the question is, I mean, it's a logical follow on of the system. Okay. Um, so let me thank you for your question. So let me, let me, let me see if I can uh, answer that. So if your, if your point, sir, is that, you know, a lot of it's about the media, um, and, you know, the results when it comes to Fox, suggest to the extent that that is indicative of the media influence on support for the Tea Party, that is certainly true. Um, but even when we account for, so if we sort of think about this, even once we account for the power that Fox has when it comes to uh, promoting support for the Tea Party, even after you account for that, there's still something left to be explained for why they're so hostile, for example, to Obama. If it were really mainly about the media, then there would be no real connection between their activity between the Tea Party and their activity for Obama. But that's something that we took into consideration as we investigated this. And the media, to the extent that it is, that it can be uh, Fox can be used as a proxy, right, is really important. But it's, it's far from the entire story. It's, it's not the entire story at all. It's not even, it's, a, it's an important part of it, but it's far from the entire story. Well, I kind of remember that uh, Bill Clinton, they were hostile to him also. And I'll bet you that Hillary is in there. They're going to be these same groups 
they're, they're going to be hostile to all of them, you know, you know unless, uh, unless you pass the trade agreements and do everything that, uh, you know, the groups want. Well, but, well, well, well but, okay, yeah, yeah they, they were hostile to them, right, but we didn't see the Tea Party in the middle of what they I, I, I said earlier that the Tea Party is the current day iteration of these other reactionary right wing movements. We didn't see them on the I mean, they never called Bill, they never suggested he wasn't a real American. They didn't make suggestions that he was, I don't know, a philanderer, right? Uh, to put it mildly, philanderer. Um, but, they, but, but they never suggested that he was a real American, that he wasn't a real American. They never said, like, he, like Obama was disrespected on the tarmac in, in Arizona with a jam broker in his face pointing her finger at him like he was a little kid. Um, they never um, stood up, and he had two terms as well, and said in a joint session of Congress, you lie in the disrespect with which this man is treated is just far beyond the pale. I mean, we didn't say that the that, that, that progressive disrespected Bush, too. I mean, they, they said some mean things about him, too, right? But nothing to this level, though, right? Nothing to this level. But, but, uh, yeah, but, but, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, have, yeah, they, yeah, they tried to leave you, but, but, but you have to remember that all this consolidation of all these groups took place under Clinton, and the trade agreements were signed under Clinton, and he auctioned off the airways, and all the monopolists, you know, nobody challenged him any antitrust action, and so the result is where we are right now. So I'm just going to move this to the next question. Not because your point's totally off base, but because I think you made your response to it. Uh, yes, why, why do you think um, the Tea Party has endured better than Occupy did? Well, the Tea Party has a lot more, um, as someone hit on, hit on earlier, you know, with the infrastructure, they have a lot more infrastructure, right? Occupy Wall Street did not have nearly the infrastructure the Tea Party had both financially, also when it comes to their commitment, right? Now, I don't really, we didn't have any measures on Occupy Wall Street when we put our surveys in the field. So I can't, I cannot tell you the percentage of population um, that were sympathetic to Occupy Wall Street. But the simple fact of the matter is, is these people, the people that support the Tea Party, you know, much of their credit, they are committed. They have the courage of their convictions, right? But more importantly, they have this vast infrastructure of really wealthy people that don't want to see this progressive agenda pass, right? And so I would say the key difference is one that it tends to be two. It's just an infrastructural advantage that supported the Tea Party or the Tea Party Act. Now, they, they, they think about the Republican Party, right? How the Republican Party is part of this institutional infrastructure. We've got the financial infrastructure, but also have this institutional infrastructure that's associated with the Tea Party. It gives a huge advantage for all folks who are out of Wall Street. They also have seats in American symbols that are, that are, that are up in the Tea Party. And it's a very powerful symbol in this country. So they, they locate themselves in a, in a, a historical trajectory Um, I've been told by two more questions, so others who won't get the question asked, I'm sure Chris will be happy to, to stick around and ask some questions while we're doing the book signing. So this gentleman and then this gentleman. So um, I came tonight because I'm very concerned about the dysfunctional, toxic political dynamic we have here, and I thought if I understood the uh, interests and values of the Tea Party better, I could have sort of a political, um, uh, uh, you know, an informed uh, Based on you know your understanding, right? Didn't quite get there, honestly, from the guy who the book, right? Um, based on your understanding of the data and the um, a deeper understanding of the Tea Party, what does that say about what we should be doing politically to uh, uh, heal or um, uh, restore some kind of effective political process? Um, would you say that so that so we don't have the red line that we have today? So, I mean, I think of uh, a way to uh, engage the Tea Party as one strategy, vanquish the Tea Party as another strategy, or wait for them to die. You suggested that, or transform. I mean, really, what what is the um, kind of the effective consequence of the, of the research? Let me, let me just kind of piggyback on it. So, short of vanquishing, so I'm assuming many, some here would say, let's try to get the results. So let's, let's take the other tack. How do, how do we? In this moment, without vanquishing, said that 
you know, I said earlier that folks who join us for the Key Point, Key Point Hotel, political differences with uh, progressives, right? Um, they will go. It's going to be really difficult to work things out. And so let me put this in context. So these, when I say these folks, He's one of the heroes, right? But Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan uh, had, uh, you know, that conservative, hardcore conservative scene um, that really wasn't there because Reagan passed, he signed off on the Immigration uh, Reform and Control Act that pulled the focus amnesty to 3 million undocumented. Uh, Reagan doubled the federal budget deficit during his watch. Right, so these are all things that you know these people want to. Oh, and you know, so Reagan had he compromised on a lot of stuff, right? But they don't want to recognize that, right? They don't want to recognize that part of uh, Reagan's legacy. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that these folks, to the extent that Reagan is their hero, it, it's, it, they don't recognize the spirit of compromise. I mean, how we compromise you know, with the Democrat, how we compromise with Kevin O'Neill, right? These folks did it today, they do not want to compromise. So sort of reaching out, in other words, and trying to negotiate with them, it's a non-starter, right? It is a non-starter. The best way to get rid of the Tea Party, to be quite honest right now, is for the president to exit stage, I guess you guys probably say left, actually stage middle right now. It's for him just to go away. Right? If he goes away, then they can go away until they see another threat that is manifest in a political environment. There's no working with most of these people. Some of them, yeah, I don't know, maybe the absolute statement, but most of them, they are not willing to compromise. So there's an, an, until, and one of the things that I just read in this book, and which is one of the reasons why we have such polarization now, and we didn't have it during uh, the post war years, for the first 20 years, is because we have the social movement, we have this social movement right now that's pulling the Republican Party to the right, right? And so if you look at the political polarization that's been happening in Congress for the last 20 years, it's really about the Republican Party moving further and further to the right in response to these political, these reactionary political movements on the right, right? We really haven't had much of that, you know, on the left in the last 20 years, right? Yeah, doing the 50s, yeah, civil rights, 50s, 60s, civil rights movement, Pulled, um, actually, the civil rights movement actually got more support from Republicans. Now, come to think about it, that's what they think about it, right? So they had moderate Republicans and they had some moderate Democrats in their camp, right? But since then, the 70s going until now, you have these hardcore right wing movements that are pulling and have continued to pull the Republican Party to the right. So, you know, in this case, it's Barack Obama and what he's perceived to represent that's pulling the Republican Party to the right via the Tea Party. So there's no negotiating with these folks. So basically, once Barack Obama leaves office, right, they'll go away, right? But they'll come back to something else. But it's just, it's just going to be really hard to negotiate with these people, right? It's just it's really going to be hard.
So the reason why we say the Tea Party is the most active, well, if we think about the Jewish society as the most active, you know, that's, we sort of show, show that empirically. Even among the conservatives, they're the most politically engaged, they're the most politically knowledgeable, they know about process. Um, how do they come to activism? They're scared. They, they, are, they are truly scared that they are losing their country. That is pushing them to become more active. Let me give you one example, which let me just reference, reference uh, the, the data here real quick. It's chapter six, and so if we look at, if we compare Tea Party conservatives and non Tea Party conservatives, voter Republican in the 2010 midterm election, 96% of Tea Party conservatives did, 74% of non Tea Party conservatives. Uh, voted, uh, voted Republican in the 2010 election, 92 to 78. Um, and attended a political meeting in the last 12 months, perhaps the most telling statistic. Forty percent of Tea Party conservatives did so, only 18 percent of non Tea Party conservatives did so. Um, so the bottom line is when we interview these folks, um, when you don't get an interview, they're scared they're losing their country, right? They're losing their country to these groups or to these people, people in these groups who are not perceived as being real Americans, right? So they are motivated to political action because that is an outlet for them because they can have their policy preferences heard. And they've done a great job. If you look at the size of the Tea Party office that I showed earlier, right? It's, it's, it's pretty big in Congress, right? And we see what's happening right, not right now, with regard to the, I don't even know what the most serious thing. Uh, uh, um, we can talk about that during the book, Sign and Bank, you guys want to hang around. Or shoot me an email. I'm not hard to find. I'm the only white person in the political science department. <laughs> so, so, so to answer your question, sir, it's really out of the spirit of anxiety that they feel, right, about the changing demographic face of America, right, that is motivated, motivated them to be more active, even more so than other self-identified conservatives, right? That's, that's what has them active. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, the civil rights movement is, is dead or, or, or anything like that, because as we saw, you know, it was a big event last week, right? 50 year anniversary of uh, the March on Washington, right? So I'm not surprised they had the turnout, you know, that they had, right? But I would still say that the Tea Party, because they are so concerned, Tea Party supporters, because they are so concerned that they're losing their country, right? They are, they continue to be motivated. And so that lives in, that, that pushes them more and more towards that, and then once again, even more so than other self identified. Sure. I want to get your reaction to one thing and then close with this. Sure. Um, the Obama movement of 2006 or 7 or 8 with the force on the left and the progressive side was met by a pushback hard on the right by the Tea Party movement in 2009 or 10. Um, I studied these things too from a communication perspective. It's my take on this that there is a, there is a counter progressive movement that is now coming together that I think is going to be the next movement that is going to carry the day and overwhelm the Tea Party movement, and that is around voting rights. That I think that we have one anniversary this year of the March on Washington, next year is the Civil Rights Act, and 60, in 2015 is 50 year anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. I think Hillary Clinton has already signaled that this is going to be her moral issue. Voting rights, she's given two speeches on this already. So my take on this is that the currents the Tea Party fights against can be won over by, in mainstream American political thought, under the heading of voting rights, opportunities for all Americans, but not to be cast in racial terms, just in this kind of classic American take. What's your take on that? So the question is what again? Well, the, 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 question, is, the question is that, is there a movement on the left that you think can it can overwhelm us. It's quite, it's quite possible. Now, this is, it's quite possible. Now, I'm conjecturing now. Talk about it, but so now I'm going to conjecture. Um, I think that if you look at turnout, especially among African Americans in the 2012 election, uh, African Americans had the highest turnout of any racial, racial group. I think it was 66 or 67 percent. First time more white Americans, right? Yeah, first time that first time that uh, the black folks were 
mobilized more so than white right, uh, in the history of the country, right? So, um, and Asian Americans, Latinos are becoming more and more mobilized as well. So, if that continues to be the case, and if there continues to be some sympathy um, from progressive whites, then, you know, then it's, it's possible, right, that there could be sufficient pushback to mitigate this, this, this um, voter suppression surge that's been happening on the right. It's, it's certainly possible, right? Whether or not it's really going to happen, you know, that's, that, you know, that's ultimately a critical question. But I do think, that's a very good question, I do think it's possible. When we look at the surge in turnout last year, I mean, it was quite amazing. There were a lot of us, and David is one person who was a lot more optimistic. Last time we were on the stage, I sat up here and said, it's going to be really close, you know, the general election, because I am a little more pessimistic than David, right? I don't know why, but I just happen to be a little more pessimistic. And he was right that time, right? And I have to, and he even got the electoral vote right on the money. I still owe him. I don't know what he said, I still owe him. <laughs> so, so I think I'm pushing you on this. Uh, do you see any optimism? I, I do see a little, I do see a little optimism, but for no other reason, right? I mean, if you think about, if you really think about this, who the real Americans are, who the real Americans are, if we're talking about toleration, if we're talking about opportunity, if we're talking about people who continue to support this country, even though we weren't seen as full citizens, I'm thinking we probably are the real Americans, to be honest with you. I'm just gonna put it out there like that. That's what I think, right? And my first book, I talked about how these black men fought in World War II and the Korean War, even though they couldn't vote in the South, right? They couldn't vote. They couldn't drink the same water fountain as you guys. But they still serve their country, right? So if we're talking about American patriotism and Americanism, it's really about sacrifice and about the, the, ob the observation of these American values, right? Then, you know, I think part of it, I think, I think when this gets to your point about, it's like, no, you're not going to take this from us. We know our history. We, you are not going to take this from us, right? You're not, you're not going to let the Tea Party, we're not going to let these other right wing groups take our right to vote. It's a symbolic thing. Right? Voting for a very long time in American history was seen as the principal symbol of American citizenship, the franchise. And so people know this, right? We know this. Other people of color know this. Progressive whites know this, right? And obviously the people on the radical or reactionary right know this as well, right? So if there's any room for optimism here, thank you for permitting me to even if I really believe it, yes, there's some room <laughs> for optimism here. <laughs> Chris Parker. <laughs> Books over here, Chris will be the same.